everybody. Thanks for coming. Hi. Um, I'm Rick Rizzi. I'm the events organiser for the University of Leicester Palestine Tornado campaign. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. Um, as a part of Israeli apartheid week this year, uh, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign are dedicated to raising awareness about uh, Israel's policies towards Palestinians and more importantly what we want to do here is open up the debate about these policies and how they're affecting Palestinian citizens. Uh, before I introduce the panellists, I'd just like to make a final note before we start the discussion. The Palestine Solidarity Campaign at the University is dedicated to building a dialogue between Israel and Palestine and by having this discussion, what we really hope to do is open up the debate between both sides in order to broaden our understanding of the conflict and how we can achieve peace in this region. Uh, for the panel discussion, we'll be focusing on the debate surrounding the view that Israel is an apartheid state. Uh, tonight, we'll be joined by Dr. Carly Prestel. Uh, she'll be only joining us for 15 minutes, uh, just for unforeseen circumstances. She's a lecturer at the University of Leicester and a reader in modern European and Jewish history. She's also taken extensive research in German Jewish history and in particular social and women's history in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, also, Alan Johnson, who's kindly joined us today, he's the editor of Fathom Magazine, and this is a magazine that aims to promote a deeper understanding of Israel and the region. He's also a senior research fellow at the Britain Israel Communications and Research Centre, and also a professor of democratic theory and practice. And also, finally, Ishmael Patel. He's a commentator for The Guardian, The Independent, and Al Jazeera English. He's the founder of Friends of a Luxor organization, an NGO which is concerned with defending the human rights of Palestinians and protecting the Alexa Sanctuary in Jerusalem. And to start with tonight, uh, Dr. Cordia will just like to say a few words before Shasta leaves us, just around the topic that we'll be talking about tonight. Okay, uh, last year I was uh, teaching in Regensburg in Germany. My students were always writing their essays and I concluded about uh, how nice it would be if there was peace in the Middle East. And I usually wrote back and said, why do you want to ruin people's businesses? I mean, what's the matter with you? So, of course, on a less sarcastic note, uh, who profits from the occupation? is of course one of the websites, I mean if there was no profit being made out of the occupation then maybe, maybe we would be a step closer to peace. Maybe, only maybe. Now the other issue is of course uh, what you said, you know, is, uh, is there apartheid happening uh, in Israel or in the occupied territories? Again, before I came here, after three hours of uh, teaching on Palestinian citizens of Israel, so not Palestinians in the occupied territories, but Palestinian citizens of Israel, I just quick, quickly flipped through my email, and the news is that apparently now there are special buses for uh, Palestinians. <coughs> Uh, well, I don't know what word to use for this, but this pretty much comes close uh, to segregation or apartheid. And of course, we all uh, know about the wall that is being built and that destroys the livelihood of the Palestinians, that separates Palestinians from Palestinians, that further contributes to the de-development uh, of Palestinians and to the economic crisis which has been ongoing since, uh, well not since 67 because there was actually a short period of the economy flourishing before uh, it went uh, downhill again. Now, um, in terms of the uh, policies of the Israeli state, may, uh, Asmi Pshara, uh, who was a uh, Knesset member, a member of the Israeli parliament, a Palestinian citizen of Israel, would uh, argue that if one group has sovereignty and the other doesn't, that is called uh, apartheid. Other uh, scholars argued that it is more useful to talk about Israel as an ethnocracy or an ethnic demography because, uh, again, uh, it is not a liberal democracy in the Western uh, understanding of the term because of its uh, discrimination uh, policies, first of all, against uh, its own citizens, and one only needs to think of the Bedouin in the desert who are Israeli citizens who serve in the army even, 
and to have their homes uh, demolished on more or less a regular basis and of course are discriminated against on uh, many other levels. Whereas the Palestinians living in the occupied uh, territories in Gaza and uh, the West Bank where basically they can't uh, do anything that the Israelis don't want them to do. So there is no freedom of uh, movement. There is an increasing poverty about uh, at least 60 to 70 percent of the population in Gaza, the figure is higher, lives below the poverty line. And again, it's a deliberate uh, policy. It doesn't just happen because uh, people are poor. Now, of course, there is the uh, ongoing land confiscation, and I mentioned the house demolitions already, uh, either because uh, somebody has been suspected of so-called terrorist activities or uh, be for uh, any other uh, reason, homes uh, can get demolished and are demolished on a regular basis, and the Israeli Committee Against House Demolition has uh, the exact figures. We know that people are being prevented from uh, reaching uh, hospitals when the soldier at the checkpoint doesn't feel like it. We know about women uh, giving birth at checkpoints. We know about people dying, again, because they can't reach uh, hospitals. So essentially, uh, we know about the settler violence, the fundamentalist um, settlers who moved into uh, the West Bank uh, after the war in 67 and who harass Palestinians on a daily basis, uh, destroying their olive trees, uh, setting fire to olive groves uh, to the point of not only harassing but killing uh, the people with the idea of generally standing idle by, which has been documented sufficiently by B'Tselem, an Israeli human rights organization. And of course, uh, one can go on and on about the human rights abuses uh, that have been happening since uh, 67, since the occupation, and are on and on and ongoing. Now, I think you also asked me to draw the comparison a little bit with South uh, Africa and, um, and uh, Israel. Now, uh, uh, clearly, there are a lot of similarities between these two states, uh, now with the two systems. What, of course, Israel also does and has done successfully is always eliminating uh, any Palestinian uh, who uh, could be the kind of spokes, uh, the partner, so to speak, uh, for uh, peace and in the general Israeli uh, rhetoric is there is no one to talk to, there is no partner for peace, but even non-violent resistance is, of course, uh, being uh, oppressed. So we are not even talking about what is generally called terrorism, we are even talking about non-violent uh, <coughs> resistance. The villages in Berlin and others who uh, have been demonstrating against the wall, who have been demonstrating against, uh, against um, the confiscation of land, again are constantly uh, being uh, harassed. And the activists are uh, either being killed or arrested. We know of just a few days ago another Palestinian prisoner uh, being uh, died of, as a result of torture in Israeli jails, which again we know is illegal according to international law. And just uh, before we started talking, we started talking about prisoner X, which uh, you will probably, you might probably want to talk a little bit more about prisoner X because you're off to Australia and to Melbourne, the world's most livable city, according to my view, of course. Now, I think I'll leave it at this, and I probably, if people want to have questions, then they may do so. Yeah. Um, before Claudia goes, does anyone have any questions? Claudia, before we move on. Huh? 
They're like my students. They never have any questions <laughs> either. <laughs> yes? You, you're obviously a tough school where you, you, you believe that it is what is relevant to you is a tough thing, right? Looking back through the history, at what point did apartheid break down in South Africa? And you, at what point did you believe this, this will be reached? Well, from what I understand in South Africa, because you obviously had Mandela, and you had the clerk on the other side, and you had the uh, isolation of the world, so, so to speak, when uh, when it was no longer acceptable to have apartheid. So uh, that the state, in a sense, was forced to change its attitude. And of course, the, uh, this is the attitude of those uh, who support the BDS, who argue uh, that we need to have the same strategies that we had in uh, South Africa. And when the struggle in South Africa began, uh, people who were active in the anti-apartheid struggle thought the, st the struggle would never end, which of course in the Finnish it did. Now, this doesn't mean that there are not enormous economic problems, and it doesn't mean that now so South Africa is a paradise on earth, but at least apartheid, official apartheid has come to an end. Thanks very much for inviting me. I think debate is always a very good thing. I'm always happy to be, debate with the PSA as my sister's a member. So, um, no problem there. Um, what are we debating tonight? Um, I'm going to suggest we're debating a, a calumny, which is a word which means a deliberately malicious misrepresentation of the facts about a particular matter in order to ruin the reputation of whomever is the target. I'm not here tonight because I think there's a serious debate to be had about whether Israel is an apartheid state or not. It's not. The debate is partly why you've chosen to frame Israel as an apartheid state. Shouldn't Friends of Israel therefore just ignore it? No, because as uh, Robbie Sable says, if Israel's detractors can associate Israel, the Jewish movement for self-determination, with white supremacist rule of a loathed South Africa, then they won't have just done damage to Israel. They will do, and my argument is you are doing damage both to the Palestinians and to the Middle East peace process itself. I've come here tonight to tell you the framework you've adopted to talk about this issue is a damaging framework, not just for Israelis, but for Palestinians and for the peace process. How did this apartheid smear get going? Two key moments. The first moment is the campaign launched by the Soviet Union and the Arab states in the 1970s, allied with the non-aligned movement, to frame Israel and to frame Zionism as a form of racism. And they used their inbuilt majority in the General Assembly in 75 to get that passed. In 2001, the next key date at the World Conference Against Racism in Durban, there was another key moment when, not because of what the states there did, but because of the NGOs who were there in a very organized and pre-planned way, released a statement out of Durban denouncing Israel as a racist apartheid state and calling for the total and complete isolation of Israel. They set off a campaign, one of the elements of which was apartheid weeks, and that's why we're sitting here tonight. For the record, and the record matters, the Durban gathering was truly astonishing anti-Semitic hate fest, which you do need to know about that event. There were Arab lawyers' union distributing pamphlets filled with grotesque caricatures of who knows Jews depicted as Nazis spearing Palestinian children. Attempts to have the group's credentials uh, removed were refused. There was a, a march led by Palestinians at the end of the gathering in which a placard was held aloft which said Hitler should have finished the job. People were selling the protocols of the elders of Zion around and about the gathering. So it's an attempt to delegitimize the Jewish national movement and it's pernicious. Is there anything to the charge? No, because after all, what was apartheid? It was a policy of racial segregation and discrimination enforced by a white minority government in South Africa from 48 to 94. It involved such things as prohibitation of marriages between white people and people of other races, prohibitation of extramarital sex, forced physical segregation, prohibition on um, black people performing skilled work, and of course, um, prohibition on voting. Is that 
what Israel is today? Absolutely not. And I'll separate that answer now into two sections. First, Green Line Israel, Israel within the 67 borders, is that apartheid? And secondly, Israel's policies in the territories, are they apartheid? In, in neither case are they remotely like apartheid. Let's deal first of all with Green Line Israel. Ben White, in his book, argues that Israel, quote, Israel is not a state for all its citizens, or it's rather a state for some of its citizens, Jews. It's absolutely wrong. Israel is a multi-racial, multi-ethnic society, and the Arab minority of more than one million participate fully in the society and the political process. Here are some non-Jews in Israel. This is the former deputy speaker of the Knesset, acting president of Israel, February 2007, non-Jew. This is George Kara. He was the Arab who was sitting on the panel which convicted the former president of Israel of crimes and obstruction of justice and jailed him, non-Jew. This is the Supreme Court Justice, Salem Jubrin, non-Jew. This is Professor Ashraf Brick at Ben Gurion University, winner of the 2011 Young Chemist Award, an Arab. This is the ambassador to Ecuador. This is the ambassador to Norway. This is the IDF Major General. And this is Omar Barghoudi, who is a resident of Ramallah, leading advocate for the academic boycott of Israel. And let's not mention the fact he's also a doctoral student at Tel Aviv University. No hypocrisy there. In Israel, Arabs are represented in the Knesset, the 17 in the last Knesset. Arabs have served in the cabinet, in high-level foreign ministry posts, and on the Supreme Court. First Israeli Muslim ambassador, 95. First Druze ambassador, 99. First Arab Israeli team to win the state cup from football, if you want to know, 2004. Arabs have freedom of movement, assembly, and speech. Arabs are heads of hospital departments, university professors, senior Arab police, and army officers. Israeli towns have mixed Arab and Jewish populations. Employment, according to the Bank of Israel in 2011, the employment rate for Arab men between 25 and 64 was 72%. For non-Arab citizens, 77.7%. So not completely equal, but 72% against 77%. Arabs in Israeli society get all the advantages um, of Israelis, take health care. The standard of health care available to Israel is far higher than the neighboring Arab states, and Arab life expectancy is um, considerably higher. These are not just individual rights, but collective rights facilitated through the use of Arabic, which is Israel's second language, a separate Arab and Druze school system, Arabic mass media, literature and theatre, maintenance of independent Muslim, Druze, denominational courts which adjudicate on issues of personal status. All of this explains why, please listen to this statistic, 77% of Israeli Arabs say they would prefer living in Israel to any other country on offer. 77% of Israeli Arabs say they would stick to live there. Could you have found a statistic of that kind amongst blacks living under de Klerk and Israeli apartheid? So, none of this is by accident. The Israeli Declaration of Independence contains these sentences. Israel will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. The Israeli Supreme Court has ruled that it's a basic constitutional principle to prohibit discrimination. What's going on? <coughs> The apartheid charge portrays the Arab-Israeli conflict falsely to you as a dispute motivated by alleged Jewish race hatred of Arabs or suprem Jewish supremacism, rather than what it is, which is a conflict between two peoples with complicated histories, both of whom can claim reasonably to have been victimized through those histories, and they're in a complicated process of negotiation over the division of a small bit of land between the two peoples, trying to negotiate two states for two peoples. The apartheid smear gets in the way of you saying that. It gets in the way of the correct attitude towards both parties, which should be bringing them, the moderates together on both sides to make peace. It polarizes the debate and identifies you wholly with one side as the, like a Wild West movie almost, the goodies, and wholly against the other side as the baddies, creating exactly the kind of atmosphere in global civil society which is counterproductive to the peace process and counterproductive to the atmosphere of trust that's needed between the parties. So am I saying things are perfect for Israeli Arabs? Not at all. Visit our Israel regularly. I was in the Negev Desert talking to Bedouins in Rahat, talking to Benny Big and the minister responsible for all of that. There are problems, absolutely. Which society does not have problems integrating minorities? But here's some of the differences. The Israeli cabinet set up the Or Commission in 2000. The Or Commission reported and the cabinet accepted its judgment, which was that there is 
serious discrimination, serious inequalities in society, and they have to be dealt with. That's why, for instance, there is now a 3.9 billion program around the multi-year development plan for Israeli Arabs aimed at encouraging development. An authority was set up for economic development in the Arab sector in 2008, right out of the Prime Minister's office, which highlights the importance of economic development for the Arab sector as a strategic national goal, as a national goal of Israel. Just one decision in that, decision 2861, if you want to know which decision it is, gives around 645 million just for the purpose of strengthening Arab communities in the spheres of education, welfare, housing, employment, and religion. <coughs> okay. Let's move on. The notion that Israel is a Jewish state and therefore is discriminatory to non-Jews is largely based on a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding of what Jewish state means. It's not a theocracy. It doesn't mean it's a halakhic state in that sense. Israel is governed by the rule of law drafted by democratically elected parliament. It has no state religion. All faiths enjoy freedom of worship, yet it's attacked for its Jewish character. And let's, let's register the double standards here. All the Arab states which are and have Islam as their official religion are regarded as, as legitimate. <coughs> yes, Israel is a nation state, the national home of the Jewish people with a non-Jewish national minority. You know what? Big deal. There are nation states all over the world identified with a majority group which have minorities within them. Israel is the norm, not the exception in that regard. Most states emerged out of the era of imperialism, out of colonial domination, have based themselves on the rights of a particular nation to self-determination. In such cases, there are always urgent questions to do with the position of minorities who aren't part of the nation which has established a nation state. In that regard, Israel is no exception either. Many, many countries around the world have national minorities and we judge them on how well they integrate or fail to integrate that national minority. There are states that call themselves Arab or Arab Muslim and they face the problem of how to treat non-Arab minorities in their territories, such as Jews. And by the way, I'd, I'll argue with anyone that Israel deals better with its non-Jewish minorities than, than Arab states have dealt with their non-Arab minorities. You might say Jews are the permanent majority, so therefore it, it must be um, discriminatory. Again, this is not unusual for one community to be a majority within a nation to seek to maintain that status. It's true of nearly every country in the world. Societies usually reflect the cultural identity of the majority. India and Pakistan were established around the same time as Israel through a violent partition. No one believes these nations are illegitimate, but Pakistan is an illegitimate nation because it's a Muslim majority nation and will remain so, or that India is, because it's a Sikh nation, is an illegitimate nation because of that. You wouldn't even think of making that argument. Yet you make the argument that because the Jewish nation is a Jewish state, it's somehow exceptional. Many countries have official religions, UK, Norway, Greece, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. Many countries use religious or ethnic religious symbols on their flags, Sweden, Switzerland, Denmark, Iraq. Many countries have a right of return, Ireland, Germany, and others. I'll, I'm gonna skip the history, because we, we, we can talk about the history in the, um, in the um, discussion period, perhaps. The law of return. This is often used as an example of what's um, racist about Israel, the law of return. The law of return, which is that any Jew around the world can claim citizenship in Israel, was enacted to provide a safe haven for Jews who for centuries had suffered persecution around the world, culminating in the Holocaust. That's why there's a law of return. It grants a special citizenship track to Jews seeking to um, acquire citizenship. Once they have arrived, there is no distinction between the Jews who have attained citizenship by returning, making Aliyah from the UK, for instance, and those Israeli citizens who are already there. Yes, it's less than universalism before to get into Israel in that regard. Talia Sassen, the, the legal theorist, argues this. Yes, it is less than full cosmopolitan universalism in that sense. Once you arrive, it isn't. Once you arrive, citizens have the same rights. But who do you want to blame for that contradiction? I would say, look, welcome to history. That's how history turned out. Blame the crooked timber of humanity. That's how that turned out too. Jews tried assimilation, and they got the Holocaust. They in Germany, the most assimilated group were the Jews. More iron crosses in the First World War than any other group, completely disproportionate to the, in the population. The most German patriotic cultural people you could find were the Jews. They, what they got out of it was the Holocaust. 
Many Jews would argue they tried assimilation and they felt the need to create a nation state of their own, a place that was a sanctuary. So if, if, and if there had been such a sanctuary in place before the Nazis rose to power, hundreds of thousands at least of Jews would have been saved. So that's why that's the place. There's a recognition of this in international law, which mandates the establishment of special measures for the advancement of certain racial or ethnic groups for protecting their equal enjoyment or exercise of human rights and fundamental freedoms. UN committee said this provision is intended to remedy inequality resulting from the circumstances of history that continue um, to be uh, relevant today. And that's really what the law of return is about. Right, the territories. So people are often willing to say, look, I accept your argument. It seems a bit bonkers to say that the position of the Israeli Arab minority within Israel itself is akin to apartheid. I accept that. That's bonkers. Let's put that aside. What I'm really talking about is the territories. So, so let's move on to the territories themselves. Is Israel's policy and practice in the territories a case of apartheid? Let's step back a little bit, and I'm going to go through all of them. Now we're in the questions, anything you want to talk about. If we step back a little bit, though, and try and get the frame right, try and get the big picture right in which you, you address yourself to the practices which we have talked about. Some context. First, almost all Palestinians are not citizens of Israel. They're citizens of the Palestinian Authority established by the Oslo Accords in the 1990s. More than 95% of the Palestinian population is under the jurisdiction of the Palestinian Authority. Secondly, to try and extend Israeli citizenship to those Palestinians would amount to the annexation of the West Bank, which Israel doesn't want and nobody else wants either because that would preempt what everyone does want, which is the creation of two states for two peoples. That's why they don't vote in the Knesset. That's why they don't have Israeli citizenship or are subject to Israeli law. Third, a political settlement, a two-state solution, will result in the creation of a Palestinian state in most of the areas controlled by Israel. Why does that context matter? Because it tells you what you're looking at. You're looking at occupation, which everyone wants to bring to an end, as quickly as possible through negotiation guaranteeing Israel's security alongside a viable and contiguous Palestinian state. That's what everyone wants. That's what's at issue, occupation, not apartheid. There's an enormous difference between the two things, between an unresolved national question, which we can recognize and deal with politically, and a question of racial supremacism, which we can um, uh, dismiss. Right, again, I don't want to go through the peace process and how many um, proposals Israel has made. We can talk about that in the discussion. We can talk about the appeal. Commission in 37, the UN partition plan in 47, the offer made after the 67 war. We can talk about Camp David or Annapolis and so on. In every case, I'll give you an argument why Israel made an offer to divide the land. I will then issue you a challenge. Tell me the Palestinian counter offer at any point from the 30s with Peel to Annapolis in 2008. Show me the Palestinian counter-offer that said we want to divide the land. You won't be able to provide it. There has been no counter-offer to this day to repeated Israeli attempts to divide the land. That also is part of the difference. Now, it also tells you that what you're looking at when you're looking at the specifics that you talk about when you say apartheid is happening in the West Bank, what you're looking at are the consequences of an unresolved national question, the consequences of occupation, and the consequences of the Palestinians turning from the Second Intifada to terrorism, to the murder of over a thousand Israelis, to the maiming of many more thousand Israelis, and the traumatizing of many more thousand Israelis than that, and the collapse of the economy at that point. You're looking at a series of measures, self-defensive measures brought in at that point to deal with security. So let's just deal with a couple of them and others can come up in the discussion. Um, apartheid roads, the idea that there are some roads, there are some roads close to some traffic due to repeated shootings, bombings and other attacks on travelers on those roads. They're not designated though for the exclusive use of Jews or the exclusive use of settlers. It ignores the fact that the Israeli traffic moving along these roads also contains the over one million Arabs who are also Israeli citizens and who are also subject to terrorist attacks in that period. There's checks and balances. The Supreme Court in 2009 ordered the opening of Israeli-only roads on the grounds that its closure to Palestinians was not justified in security concerns. The Israeli Supreme Court looks at all of these specific measures that you're going to say are examples of apartheid 
and it tells the executive to change what it's doing. It reviews the balance constantly between human rights and security, and it, both in the war and in, for instance, the, um, the roads, and it tells the government to change what it's doing. Now look at the war, the apartheid war. Israel's separation barrier, only a tiny fraction of which, less than 3%, or about 10 miles, is a 30-foot high concrete wall. But from the media, you get the impression the whole thing looks like that. It separates primarily Israeli citizens and non-citizens. It doesn't separate races, and it doesn't separate ethnic groups. On the Israeli side of the barrier live Israeli citizens of all races and all nationalities, including Israel's 20% Arab population. The population on the Palestinian side of the barrier is also mixed Arab and Jewish. Here's why it was built. Please listen to these statistics. Prior to the barrier's construction, which began in 2003, the, the population was subject to a terrorist campaign targeting buses, restaurants, Jewish religious celebrations, and other public gatherings that killed and injured thousands. Here are the facts. During the 34 months from September 2000 until the first construction of the wall in the end of July 2003, in that three-year period, West Bank terrorists carried out 73 attacks in which 293 Israelis were killed in three years. <coughs> Don't think about for Britain, just multiply it by 10. So you now end up with um, something around 3,000 Britons killed in a three-year period. Can you imagine the clamor that would be in this country if 3,000 Britons had been killed in a three-year period? You think offense would be the least that would be done in this country? To, se to separate the people who are the victims of those terrorist attacks from those who are perpetrating them? Well, have a think about that. In the 11 months between the erection of the first segment of the wall and the beginning of August 2000, at the beginning of August 2003 and the end of June 2004, only three attacks were successful. Since construction of the fence began, the number of attacks has declined by more than 90%. The Is Is Israeli Supreme Court reviewed the root of the barrier and has altered it on more than 100 occasions. Not just once or twice, but more than 100 occasions. Israel's not the only democracy to build a fence like this. India is constructing a 460-mile barrier in Kashmir to hold infiltration supported by Pakistan. Complaining about that? No? Saudi Arabia is building a 60-mile barrier along an undefined border zone with Yemen to hold arms smuggling. You complaining about that? I don't hear it. Yes, the International Criminal Court issued a ruling, but that ruling's often misinterpreted. <coughs> What's important to know is also that there was no reference to the apartheid wall, no use of the word apartheid in that ruling. And even though the International Court criticized the root of the wall, they did not deny Israel's right in principle to build such a security fence. Let me just say, Palestinian only buses. I've got an article appearing in World Affairs tomorrow or the day after about this. What a lot of rubbish. Palestinian only buses. This is what's happened. Had Palestinians trying to get into Israel to work had a couple of options. One was to get an incredibly expensive private taxi service, which was unregulated, to get into Israel. The other was to walk to somewhere like Ariel, which was very difficult, and then get a bus that was shared. Okay? There were, in the context of more than an uptick in Molotov cocktail incidents, stone throwing and so on, some incidents in which there was nervousness amongst Israelis on buses, and some people were asked to leave them. That's, that happened. Absolutely. The bus company said, look, what we're going to do is we're going to lay on some buses on a route from, Palest from the Palestinian Authority area into Israel. <coughs> Palestinians, by the way, love it. It started yesterday morning, there wasn't enough. The only problem yesterday morning, there weren't enough buses. They love the fact that they don't have to put themselves in the hands of um, these rip-off private taxi firms, and they don't have to walk to Ariel anymore. It's a bus service. The way this has been blown up, just jumped on as Palestinian-only buses. Absolute nonsense. Checkpoints. Why are there checkpoints at all? To present, prevent Palestinian terrorists from conducting terrorist attacks. A thousand killed, as we said. They're temporary, and they're justified by security threats. So you say, well, if they're temporary, presuming they can come down if there's no threat. That's exactly what's been happening. In 2003 to 6, there were about 376 to 735 checkpoints. Now there are about 97 fixed checkpoints. Most of them are basically open. And they're Bet Salem figures, which we mentioned by the previous speakers, Israeli NGO figures. 
So the checkpoints are not there for the permanent control of the Arab <laughs> population in the way that the apartheid regime kept down the, the, the black population in South Africa. They're there as security measures, self-defense measures, against an onslaught, a terrorist onslaught, which killed over a 1,000 Israelis in a short period of time. And then you say ill people <coughs> are, are, you know, we hear these stories because an, an individual IDF soldier just happens to want to make people wait. I mean, please. What actually happened in terms of why sometimes people needing medical treatment are nonetheless checked at the borders, I've got numerous examples here, just to give you one, which was in June 2005, a 21-year-old was arrested attempting to smuggle an explosive belt through a checkpoint. She'd been admitted on humanitarian grounds to the Soroka Medical Center several months after being, having massive burns. She admitted that the Fatah Alaska Martyrs Brigade had instructed her to use her personal medical authorization documents to enter into Israel and carry out a suicide attack. She said on television her dream was to be a martyr and she wanted to kill 40 or 50 people. A Palestinian doctor hearing this, Dr. Isidine Abulesh, a Palestinian obstetrician and gynecologist from a refugee camp in the Gaza Strip said of this he was outraged at the cynical and potentially deadly suicide bombing attack. So again, it isn't some individual idea of soldier who just fancies making a pregnant woman wait. That's rubbish, to be, to be honest with you, with all due respect. There are serious security concerns that are being addressed by that. I know we haven't got long, so I'm going to skip a lot of stuff and just read, they can come up in the, um, in the discussion. I just want to end on this note, which is, if you think, you might be thinking, okay, look, I agree with you now that the whole apartheid charge is wrong, that it's over the top, that there's so many differences between Israel and South Africa, it's really not to be made, but nonetheless, maybe it's useful. Maybe tactically it's useful because it puts a lot of pressure on Israel. It makes Israel feel a pressure on the world community, isolated so they're more likely to be malleable with the Palestinians and so on. Briefly, why I think that's wrong. The, the campaign is poisonous. The campaign that some of you are involved in, I'd say, is poisonous, both to Israelis and Palestinians and the peace process, for about seven reasons it does harm. Very quickly, first, it creates a completely distorting lens for analysis. You never see the actual conflict. You never see the actual national question between two peoples, both of whom have absolute rights to national self-determination, and who have ended in negotiations repeatedly to divide the land to provide it and need to do so again, with Obama in and Kerry in and a new coalition emerging in Israel, we're entering a new moment where negotiations are possible. By heaping absolute culpability on Israel and absolute victim status on the Palestinians, you actually don't do anyone any favors. Secondly, by demonizing Israel, you push Israelis into the arms of the right. You push Israelis into the arms of people who say, there's no point talking about peace, they don't understand us, they don't care about our security concerns, they misrepresent us terribly to the world, so why should we trust any of them? Let's circle the wagons and let's have a, a, you know, a policy of not, not reaching out to others. It's a polarizing framework. Thirdly, you're very effective at encouraging those in Palestine who want to fight against Israel. I don't think you're very effective in encouraging those in Palestine who want to make peace with Israel and build a state alongside Israel. Take a Noam Chomsky for instance. Chomsky, and this is a really a common thing that goes along with Western, um, certain kinds of Western intellectuals. They police the Palestinian national movement from the left, from London, or from Berlin, or from New York, or from Berkeley. So Chomsky said, for instance, of Abbas, of Fayyad, of the people involved in Fatah and so on. He says, the Palestinian Authority plays the role of indigenous collaborators under imperial rule, such as the black leadership of South African Bandistans did. And give me a break, right? You say Mahmoud Abbas is comparable to Boutalesi or something? It's rubbish. But what it does is it creates an environment pro Hamas. That's exactly what Hamas wants Chomsky to say. And when, ha when Chomsky then went to Hamas to stay in the Gaza Strip, did no Chomsky ask them about the differences between the ANC's Freedom Charter in South Africa, which said, we will not be like the whites that we take over from. We will have equality. Did he, did he raise about the Hamas Charter? Do you know about the Hamas Charter? Have you read the Hamas Charter? It is the worst eliminationist, genocidal, anti-Semitic document you can find. That's no exaggeration. Please go and read it. It's, it's pious eliminationist anti-Semitism, quoting the worst Hadith that you can find. And it's secular, the worst anti-Semitism. The Jews are responsible for all the wars. The Jews are responsible for all the revolutions. We'll never have peace in the world without the Jews. It's an incitement to genocide as a document. That's the Hamas document. And you want to compare them to the AMC? I mean, please. Fourth, there's a smack of we know where best in the West about this. 
The PLO and the PA have not supported the boycott of Israel. They both want to normalize relationships with Israel. They've encouraged links between Palestinians and Israelis within civil society, academia, trade unions, and on a governmental level. Next question, you dull the nerve of outrage about the things that Israel does wrong. Because what he's really saying is, look, it's always going to be like this. It's always been like this. When a particular Israeli politician says a bad thing, we want to criticize them. Well, why particularly take them up? This is just a playing out of Zionism. It's always been like this and it always will be like this. So your outrage that you should feel and your targeted criticism of something isn't there. You also can't find allies within Israel because it's all the same thing. And all the Zionists are as bad as everyone else. And it's all apartheid. You, you miss the fact that you can link up with the trade union movement. You can link up with many progressives inside Israel. You can link up with an enormous, ongoing, vibrant debate within Israel about how to resolve the national question that they're part of. Sixth, it justifies this ridiculous anti-normalization campaign. You saw that in action last week with that bloody man, for, forgive my language, George Galloway, the sycophant to Arab tyrants, who the man in a leotard impersonating a cat on Big Brother, that man who ran away from a little bespeckled Israeli kid because he couldn't debate with him. He's an Israeli, I've got to run out of the room. I'm not going to talk to him anymore. That's comic, but mostly it's serious because that running out of the room with the anti-normalization campaign does real damage. One example, the trade union movement, the history group, the Israeli trade union movement, has a link and has a relationship to the Palestinian movement, the PGFTU. Since 2008, it has an, an agreement between the two federations. The international TUC has sanctioned it. The British TUC has sanctioned it. There was plans and discussions for links between the two trade union federations. The history is committed to two states. It's been critical in the past of Israeli governments, been critical of, of aspects of the fence and so on. Yet these are the people that don't have anything to do with it. We all want to talk to the history group. Again, crazy. Last point, and then we'll end. There's real opportunity costs as well. Um, you focus upon this issue in the way that you do, it means you don't focus on other things. Let me give you a couple of statistics. In Syria, there are 70,000 Syrians have died in a matter of months. There's no solidarity, I don't know, maybe you do have a solidarity with Syria Week, and I've, I've done you a service, but maybe there's not a solidarity with Syria Week. In the entire Israeli-Palestinian conflict, from 1912 to 19, from 1920 to 2012, all of the riots, the wars, the atrocities, the intifadas and so on, how many do you think have died? But 122,000. So there's more, in 24 months in Syria have died than in 92 years in Israel-Palestine. So think about the opportunity costs of the unremitting focus that you have. I was in doing a debate the other night in King's College with the Palestinian ambassador, Manuel Hassassian, two of us. We sat on a panel together. There were four events going on in King's that night about Israel-Palestine. Four. None about Syria. In conclusion, an appeal. Why not engage in solidarity, mutual recognition, and peace? Why not disengage with apartheid talk? How and why? How? By making solidarity, by joining things like One Voice, by inviting One Voice, which has Palestinians and Israelis, both in this country and America, and in, in Ramallah, and in Tel Aviv. Why not bring people like that in together? People who bring people into the same space and talk a language of social justice, mutual recognition, and peace. It comes down, I think, to a choice of comrades, if I can use a very old-fashioned language. Who, who, who do you want to ally with? Who are your friends? And I'm going to suggest it in this kind of very odd way, which is, you can have Ben White or you can have Nelson Mandela. Ben White is an anti-Israel anti activist who has written a book about apartheid. In that book, this is what Ben White writes, an enforced Jewish superiority is intrinsic to the very fabric of a Zionist state in the Middle East. Say that again. An enforced Jewish superiority is intrinsic to the very fabric of a Zionist state in the Middle East. What that produces is the program of ending Israel, which is the program whether you like it or not, of the hardcore of the PSC and the hardcore of the BDS movement. Or you could go with Nelson Mandela. This is Nelson Mandela speaking to the South African Board of Deputies of Jews in South Africa. Mandela, as a movement, we recognize the legitimacy of Zionism as a Jewish nationalism. We insist on the right of the state of Israel to exist within secure borders, but with equal vigor, support the Palestinian right to national self-determination. We're grateful to see new possibilities have arisen. We hope and we wish to encourage this process and if we have the opportunity to assist. My case to you tonight has not been that Israel's perfect at all. Not that Israel hasn't got serious deficits in terms of its minorities. <coughs> not that its policies shouldn't be criticized. None of that. My case to you has been 
That's what you should wish for. You should wish for what Mandela wished for there. Two states for two peoples. That's what you should want to do as well. Assist, like he talked about assisting. You could put aside a polarizing, negative, counterproductive, apartheid framework and pick up Mandela's call for supporting those on both sides who support mutual recognition and two states for two peoples. If you did, just possibly our children, maybe our grandchildren, that dream that Shimon Peres has, that beautiful dream in the Oslo period when he talked about a new Middle East, permeable borders, a new economic hub of activity around Israel and Palestine radiating outwards to the region, that, that becomes possible but only if we ditch this polarizing talk this idea that it's a wild west, or a kind of you know, a simplistic story of goodies and baddies. If we look at the complexity, look at the complex histories, accept that on both sides there are people who believe in social justice and peace and national self-determination for all peoples, and that's where we put our energies, then we'll be doing a lot more good than organizing apartheid weeks. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Alan. Um, if you want to tell us Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and uh, thanks for Alan as well for coming and wanting to engage uh, in the debate. Uh, I think it's very, very commendable. And uh, it's something we should look forward to from, from core Zionist uh, supporters of Israel. But only through dialogue can change the situation on the ground. And I think living a few hundred miles away from Israel, Palestine, I think this is a perfect arena to do it. Let me first start with the definition of apartheid. Not my definition or textbook definition, but according to the definition of apartheid convention itself, backed by the United Nations. <coughs> apartheid is the purpose of establishing and maintaining the domination of one group of persons over another group of persons and systematically oppressing them. End of quote. That's the definition. It's not about white supremacists. It's not about Jews over Muslims, or Muslims over Jews, or Christians over Jews, or Muslims, any, any dimension. It's simply creating a system in which one group of people attempts to suppress another group of people through institutional means. Now, does Israel fit into this definition? It's a big question. To understand Israel, I'll have to make you think in two dimensions. Being university students, you think in four dimensions, it would be very easy for you. I'm sure it won't be very difficult at all. The first is the time dimension. The time dimension is the fact that what happened in 1947-48 is consequences and its impact are being felt today. It's a continuum. You can't look at what's happening today and think in its isolation. You have to connect it with the time. And there's a space dimension. What is happening in Gaza, Bethlehem, Khalil, Hebron, and Janine is also happening in Tel Aviv, in Yaffa, and Haifa. But, and this is the important thing, it happens at a different degree and level. Israel has created intrinsic characteristics of law and legislature in which they are instituted, like it enacts its policies at different levels on different people. So let's start first with the 1967 borders, so-called the Green Line. And let's look at Israel and what it does within this 1967 border. Now, there's two groups of people within 1967 borders, of the Israeli citizens. First, there are the Jewish people who are the majority. And then there's a minority. The minority is made up of Christians, Muslims, Druze, and non-believers, as any society does. Is there a efficiency and an allocation and institutional structure that exists in Israel that undermines this minority. Let's look at budget allocation. Since the establishment of the State of Israel, since the establishment of the State of Israel, for the development budget, only 6% has been allocated to the Palestinian indigenous minority. Only 6%, never above 6%. Housing, schooling, infrastructure, roads where the Palestinians live are always 6%. We talked about poverty. Look up Haaretz, look up United Nations, in fact, look up 2002 Israeli statistics. 15% of Israelis, Jewish Israelis, live under poverty. 15%, one five. However, 50% of Palestinian Israelis live under poverty. 
this is Israeli government statistics. Israel Musawa, this is a, a, an NGO called the Musawa Institute based in Israel, quotes that an average Palestinian family earns 63% less than an average Jewish family. This is an economic fact. Let's look at political discrimination. Leave the budget aside now. Is there a political discrimination in Israel? Alan has articulated the fact that in Israel, you're an Arab, you're a Jews, he's shown us all these pictures. Fantastic. You can go and vote in elections, you can become an MK member. There are 12 now, if, if I'm not wrong, maybe one or two less uh, than I'm mentioning. 12 MK Arab members within the Israeli Knesset. Does that mean that there's no discrimination? There's two factors here. First, those MKs have been greatly harassed physically and verbally, so much so that none of them, of the attacks that have taken place on them, have been able to bring those cases to courts because the attackers are former, their fellow MKs, Jewish MKs, who have immunity and they cannot bring them to charges. And you can look that up within the MK uh, charges. But there's also Israeli politicians, people like Lieberman. I quote, we will take care of you, this is regarding the MKs, the, the members of parliament of Israel, we will take care of you like we take care of the terrorists, quote unquote, this is last year's quote. Danny Danon, you are masked terrorists, referring to his fellow MKs, Arab MKs. There's another factor, <coughs> and this is the clever bit about Israel. Not all Arabs, the so-called Israeli Arabs, what I would like to refer to as indigenous Palestinians, are allowed to vote. 15% of Israeli Arabs, the indigenous Palestinians, are not allowed to vote because they are recognized as present absentee. George Orwell will be turning in his graves because he didn't think of that word. Present absentee in Israeli law means that they exist physically but the government and the law does not recognize them to exist. So they're present, but they're absent in the eyes of the law. And they constitute, they're not a small number, they constitute 15%, and they're not allowed to vote. So is this discriminating a group of people? Is this discrimination of one type of people over another type of people? I'll let you judge on that. Then let's look at the admission committee law that was enacted in 2011. This is not history, this is happening now, in our lifetime, 2011. The Admission Committee Law is a committee that has been created for localities in Israel, in towns, in villages, in fact, in 702 towns and villages. A committee which determines who lives in that locality. So in Britain, you can go anywhere, rent a house, as long as you've got the money, you can move in. In Israel, if you're an Arab, if you're a Druze, if you're a non-Jew, you have to apply to this committee whether you can live into that within that locality. And who is this committee controlled by? All of it is controlled by non-Palestinians. <coughs> their sole purpose is to stop the Arabs living with the Jews. I quote, there was a rabbi, Rabbi Shlomo Evni, and who passed an edict which has been signed by many, many rabbis. It's quoted in Haaretz, and his quote is, we don't need to help Arabs set down their roots in Israel. If this is not racism, I don't know what is. So they're isolated. Yes, there isn't a, this direct distinction. There isn't a demarcation area by law. But there are structures that have been created which differentiates where people can live. Let's look at the land. It's very, very interesting that a country that has been usurped from the Palestinians, nobody can deny that. Prior to 47, 48, the whole of the territory belongs to the Palestinians. Nobody can deny that. But today, a Palestinian cannot buy land cannot buy land in Israel. The Israeli land law prevents any person from selling or renting a property for more than five years to anybody else. He cannot even bequeath or transfer his property to a foreigner, quote unquote. That's the way the law ends. <coughs> then you have to look up the definition of who these foreigners are. So who are these foreigners? It's a fantastic law. You can't sell it to a foreigner. A lot of countries around the world have laws. You can't sell your land to foreigners. So has Israel. But the definition of a foreigner in Israel is a person who does not automatically have the right to emigrate to Israel according to the law of return. What does that mean? You have to be a Jew. Because it only applies to Jews. Nobody else. Is this racism? Is this institutional racism? According to the definition that 
the, the, the path that convention has given, I'll let the rest of that there. Let's look at legislation of discrimination through citizenship. Now this is a law that was acted just a few months ago, less than a year ago, in which a Palestinian living in Israel with an Israeli passport who gets married to a Palestinian in the West Bank of Gaza Strip or in the refugee camps, he has no right to bring his spouse to live with him or her. He has to move out. He has no right. Yet an Israeli who has never seen or even heard of the land only claims to be Jewish, could be in South America, could be in Africa, could be in the Caucasus, simply by the status of being Jewish, has a right to go and occupy the land of the Palestinians, the former Palestinians. Surely there's this discrepancy and hypocrisy that needs to be exposed. These are legislations. This is something we need to understand and, and try and bring into, into question of what really why people are moved to thinking that Israel is the apartheid state and to think that Israel was classified as an apartheid state in 1975 because of USSR's influence upon the United Nations is living in cloud cupola with all due respect. In 1975, the whole of the Western Hemisphere, who has a control upon the United Nations, was totally <coughs> against communism. What influence would have they had to bring about a United Nations resolution that <coughs> equated Zionism with racism? To add on that, there is only one UN resolution that has been revoked in the history of the United Nations. And that resolution is the resolution that says that Zionism is equated to racism because of the influence of the United States of America. If any country has an influence upon the United Nations, it's the United States and the Western world, not the USSR and the Arab world. I mean, you know, you don't have to be a, a political scientist or a professor of politics to understand that simple concept. Let's also talk about the present absentees. The present absentees, some of them, not all of them, some of them live in, obviously, they have to inhabit a physical space. This constitutes 15% of the population. So they live in an area called the unrecognized villages. Israel does not recognize them. Because remember, they're present but absent, so wherever they inhabit is unrecognized. <coughs> so while they pay the taxes of, to the Israeli government, because the Israeli government does not recognize them, they are present absentee and they inhabit the unrecognized villages, it does not provide any provisions to this. In fact, a Prua plan has just been passed by the Knesset last year, just before the elections, in which nearly 190,000 of these people from the unrecognized villages will be forcibly moved away from where they're living now in the Negev area. Because, they, because why? They are a democratic. The demographic threat. When your own citizens become a demographic threat, can you imagine talking about Jews of Britain becoming a demographic threat to Britain? I mean, isn't that racism? If it, that is not apartheid, I'll let you decide depending on the definition. Now, this is within 67 borders. I've only concentrated on 67 borders. There's a second dimension now. The second dimension, just to pick Alan's point, that Israel is so averse towards annexations. You know, they hate, they wouldn't want to annex West Bank. I mean, how could they annex? They're such a some fantastic institute. They don't want to take over and give passports <coughs> to the Palestinians. What are they doing in East Jerusalem? They've annexed it. They've annexed East Jerusalem. And every Zionist leader won't stop shouting at the top of his breath, the United Capital of Israel. This was called occupied in 67. So the status of the Palestinians in East Jerusalem is even worse than the status of the black people in apartheid South Africa. Hence we had Desmond Tutu say when he visited East Jerusalem, saw with his own eyes what the Palestinians were going through, that what we had in the old days in South Africa was a picnic. And this is a man who has lived through apartheid South Africa. So what's happening in East Jerusalem? In East Jerusalem between 1967 and 2010, 40, this is a United Nations, since we've been flagging the uh, leaflet, this is a United Nations statistic. 14,000 Palestinians have had their residency rights revoked. 14,000. That's not a small number for a small city. 14,000. 
what happens when you have a residency rights revoked? You become a refugee. You become a refugee and you are thrown out. You become homeless. Is this not racism? Is this not even now? We actually now moving away from apartheid system. This is beyond apartheid. 35% of land in East Jerusalem has been confiscated by Israeli settlement. And only 13%, 13% of land in East Jerusalem is accessible by the Palestinians. Despite the fact that from 1967 to today, there's, like every community, there's a growth of population. Yet the Palestinians are denied. So what do they have to do? They have to build houses. They have to extend their homes. If they build an extension to their homes, an extension for which there is no certificate provided by the Israeli government, it becomes illegal. And once it's illegal, you get demolition orders. And according to the United Nations figures, 93,000 homes in East Jerusalem alone are awaiting demolitions from the Israeli government. Can you imagine living in East Jerusalem when you don't know where you can move, where you don't know where the house is going to be demolished, where you don't have the right to move from one place to another? If this is not racism and apartheid, you know, please do inform me otherwise. Within Jerusalem alone, Jerusalem alone, not outside Jerusalem, Jerusalem alone, there's 50 checkpoints. It isolates approximately, sorry, let me just look at the figures before we, we sort of uh, argue, or argue on these figures. 55,000, 55,000 Palestinians are not allowed to access East Jerusalem, but they live within the city because of the checkpoints. So for, especially those who are religious people, between Muslims and Christians who want to go to church of Holy Sepulchre, they can't go to the church. But they can see it, physically they can see it, but they can't go. Muslims as well can see the Dome of the Rock, but they can't go. This is within Jerusalem. Now, I mean, I can carry on. But then we talk about the West Bank. The bus issue has been mentioned. To me, the bus issue is insignificant. I'll tell you why it's insignificant. Because if you only allowing a bus to be used by the Palestinians, in a way, for the Palestinians, at least it's a mode of transportation. Because worse things are happening in West Bank. Worse things are happening. It is absolutely disproportionate and misleading to say that there is not Jewish-only territories within West Bank and Jewish-only roads were exclusively for the use of Jews. This, is, this never happened during uh, the civil rights movement in, uh, in the United States of America or in South Africa, where it was exclusively for the whites. Never. It only happened in Israel. So you see the difference in time and space, that the different regions are being enacted differently. If you look at the set, now we talk about a two-state solution. Fantastic. You know, I would have loved to have a two-state solution. And I hope we have a solution uh, within the two states parameters. But I would like to ask Alan, and I'm sure he will come back, what is available there for the Palestinians to create a state upon? 78% of Palestine was occupied in, in 47-48. Of the 22% that remained, differing between different, even if it, I'm optimistic, 8% of that has gone. That leaves approximately 14%. So on 14% of the territory, that is not contiguous. That is not contiguous. In little islands, Bantustan, how are you going to create a two-state solution? And then having Gaza at the other extreme. Is that possible and viable? If it's viable, please do inform me and impress me, because I would like to join my hands with you and we create this two-state solution, because that is what we've all been, been working for all these years. But the Zionists have destroyed the hope of a two-state solution. It's not the Palestinians. We talk about Gaza. There's a great disengagement in Gaza. Israel has left Gaza. They can do whatever they like. Amazing, isn't it? If it is disengaged, why do Israeli naval boats always trying to bomb and storm those ships that are going from Europe to bring aid to the Gazans? It's disengaged itself. Surely the people of Gaza have right to use their ports and take them wherever they want. Surely they have a right to export their goods and bring in whoever they want. But no. So this disengagement is an illusion. Like an illusion of an offer of peace upon the Palestinians. There is no peace. In fact, the peace has been the greatest fraud upon the Palestinian people. And why do I say it's a fraud? If you look from the time of the peace process of the Oslo Agreement, at the time of Oslo Agreement in early 1992, Israel had approximately diplomatic relations with 24 countries, approximately. Today, 
under the guise of that peace, because Israel is on the path of peace, it has diplomatic relations with 160 countries. It has changed the parameters. This same peace, in 1992, there were approximately 98,000 settlers living in West Bank. 98,000. Today, there's 300,000 settlers living in West Bank under the guise of peace. So what is peace doing? Peace is eroding Palestine. It's dismantling this two-state solution. If you want peace, <coughs> peace can take place only through one word, justice. Without justice, there's no peace. So we need to introduce justice on the negotiation table. Bring about the, ne the, the parties, the Israelis and the Palestinians, and the international community. And let's bring about that justice. And let's let not make Zionism but an instrument to erode the rights of the Palestinians. Thank you very much.